Uh, so welcome to CARAT. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Sambrook and Jenny Hall of Trussell Archaeological Services, who will be showing what they've been doing in the Elan Valley for the past year. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody, and we're glad to see so many people, really. We weren't sure how many people we were going to get. Um, and if we seem a bit nervous, this is the first time we've done this for three years in person. We've done it via Zoom, but that's a different animal. So um, <coughs> we're hoping that it'll all go fine and without a hitch. Right, so obviously you've seen a bit of the um, publicity about what this is about, and we've been talking about some of the work we've been doing on the archaeology of um, the Elan Valley recently. Um, this is for the Elan Links project, which I um, hope you've all come across over the past few years. Um, it's a natural, National Heritage Lottery funded project um, to engage with the landscape in many different ways and try to improve what's there, take things forward for the future and manage more effectively in, in the future, both in terms of actual landscape management, tourism management, actually bringing people to engage with the valley, etc., etc. Um, we are Trussell, as um, Aster said. Um, so there's myself and Paul. Um, we started Trussell in 2004. And we do many things. We are, we are archaeologists. Sometimes we're on our knees in a trench. Many, many hours are spent in front of computers, because that's actually what you end up doing a lot of the time. But we've also been very fortunate over the past, how many years is it? 2005? 17 years, um, to do an awful lot of field survey in the uplands. All right? And um, consequently, that's why my knees don't work very well. Too much walking. Um, <laughs> the green patches on here are areas where we've surveyed the upland landscape in detail, basically walking it on foot, backwards and forwards, round and round, up and down, um, to record the archaeology that's in there. Most of this was done by, um, through Royal Commission um, on Ancient Historical Monuments funding, who had a whole landscape upland landscape survey so there were lots of other people doing this as well but the green areas are the areas that we've done and I can't remember how many it hectares or square kilometers it was it was a lot um, but so during that we recorded something like 10,000 sites archaeological sites so um, it sort of gives you a bit of an idea of, of the sort of thing um, now this particular survey obviously is and I'm going to make sure we sort of this this sort of area there, um, and is, is part of the Leland Links project. Um, you can see there we've got, hopefully you can see the orange outlines, and the smaller little area that's actually more coloured in green towards the top right up there. These are our two survey areas that we were dealing with as part of this project. The smaller area is an area that nobody had ever surveyed in detail before. Um, not, it hadn't been involved in any upland survey and hadn't really been looked at by any other survey that had been done of different, whether it was looking at cairns or, or things. The bigger area had been surveyed before, and I'll come on to that in a bit more detail at the minute, but it just gives you an idea of the area that we're covering as part of this project. Um, so right from the very top of Grey Gork Dam, beyond then um, Dolomunach Dam, right down onto the high ground to the south, and then a bit out into be below the Clowland Reservoir. Um, we weren't dealing with the reservoirs, <laughs> which, given the year we've had with the low levels in there, is sort of a bit like, oh, no. Um, but we do know some people who've done a very good survey of those. Um, and we maybe need to see how that can be put into some form of record. But we aren't dealing with, with the reservoirs. Um, so we had to keep walking past them. Every time we went past a, a low level and saw something, it was like, don't, don't look, don't look. <laughs> <clears throat> the landscapes out there are beautiful and um, quite awe-inspiring. Um, some of the best landscapes in mid Wales, really. Uh, this is from the eastern edge of the area, looking back towards Ryada. Um, 
This is looking up on the hill, looking along Dolomana Reservoir. You can sort of just about see the dam in the middle there. Um, this is slightly earlier in the year, looking down the main sweep of the, of the reservoirs from the, from the higher ground to the north. And you can see the different sorts of terrains that we're dealing with here. Again, um, <coughs> once you get up onto the tops, they're a bit flat. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually made it to the top grounds, but they're, they're quite flat, apart from to the south, where it actually does go more to a ridge and, and then down. Um, and we've been there, we started in February, I think, and then sort of finished in July. So we've been there through a range of seasons. We've seen vegetation come and go and um, colours change around us. Once the vegetation gets a bit high, it's a bit hard to do this sort of survey work that we're doing because you can't see as well. Um, if you think of if you're trying to look through bracken that's this high, it, it gets very difficult. There are certain features that will show up in bracken, but by and large, you're, you're on to really quite problematic stuff. And the purple moor grass that's up there is also very problematic. It creates a sea, whereas bracken will actually contour over things it's covering a bit. Purple moor grass or millennia just creates a level sea and you can't, can't see anything in it. And if you tried walking through some of the deeper stuff, it's very problematic. Um, the best time to deal with bracken is, is really when it's down in the winter. Um, this is the top road ride of Camusrith. Um, just an aside, really. The areas that we've been dealing with, although the Elam Valley is very popular, you know, you, you've got people driving and walking around it, particularly the low-level walks from the Elam Valley Visitor Centre and up the valley. Once you get into the higher ground, you don't see people. The only exception to that is from this road on the north, where we did see people. There, were, there is a, a path that is used regularly by cyclists, etc. And so we did see, but even then, once we got off that path, we saw nobody. We were very shocked. And one day, when, when a lady popped up in the, to the south of Clarewin Valley, a lady popped up out of nowhere. And we were completely shocked because we just uh, weren't expecting it, but he hadn't seen him. And but she was the only person we saw off the main routes um, the entire time. So it's still, even, even with sort of uh, increased publicity, increased tourism, and people sort of like trying to bag going to Drug and Vowed and things like that, you still actually don't see many people out in these landscapes. So why do we need to resurvey this area if it had already been done? Well, um, ignore that one for a second. When, when we started working with um, the Elam Valley Trust on this back in 2016, we were part of putting the bid together for the Hot All Over Road project. And one of the things we had to do was look at um, a heritage at risk survey of everything they knew they got, or thought they knew they got. Um, and so we got together a database and there was something like, we had something like 3,000 records from various different sources we had to deal with. Some of them duplicates for the same thing. So you can already start to see this is getting a little bit difficult because we've got different records for different things. And some of them were in the right place and some of them were in the wrong place. And we had to try and merge this into one data set. We did that fairly successfully. And then we had to look at the condition of the monuments we were talking about, how much at risk they were, what threats might there be. And although you might not think there are threats in this sort of landscape, you've, you've got things like stream erosion for things that are alongside a stream. Um, you've got things like millennia. Actually, the roots do break up earthworks um, and can actually sort of destroy things. So we were looking at those. But we were also looking at our confidence in the record. How confident we were we that the record we had was for a site on the ground at that point that said what it was and, you know, that it was actually the right thing. Um, so we put together that database. This is just a, um, a map showing all the concrete boundary posts around the uh, um, Elam Valley um, that define the watershed 
for the reservoirs. Um, I don't know how many, uh, I don't know if you all know about, with there's photos later of these posts. So we'll come back to those in a minute. Oh, sorry, there it is. <laughs> right, okay, uh, there's concrete boundary posts. Those dots, black dots, each one of those is one of these. Um, and you can see there BC for Birmingham Corporation is on one side facing into the area. And then on the other side is whatever the other landowner is on the other side. But so this, this survey, we, this heritage at risk database we did. We went through all the records and checked and had a look at were they where they were meant to be. Um, so we could overlay the sites we got and put them overlay aerial photographs and see if they were in the right place. We could use mapping. We could use our knowledge of sites. Now, at this point, I have to say that the area around here, around in that area that isn't coloured in, and there aren't many of these dots in, was actually areas we'd surveyed <laughs> ourselves. And the other area is an area we didn't survey. Now, although that sounds a little bit dodgy and it makes it sound like we doubted what other people were saying, there is a, there is a very good reason for this. The areas we did were 2009 onwards, um, or around 2009 anyway. We had a good GPS and it was at a point where the military had switched off their blocking. So the GPS signals on the, were reading correctly. Up to um, earlier, up to, I don't know, 2000, about 2000, the military were blocking certain satellites. So the signals you were getting on the GPS were not very good. Um, they were actually quite a way out. So a lot of the survey that was done in the coloured in area was done before that with GPSs that weren't terribly accurate. And you're also out in a landscape where if you're trying to map where you are, if you, before GPS, we all use them now. Well, we all use them. But you're used to using them. You've got them on your phones. You know, even if you don't know you're using them, you're using that sort of element. And we're used to doing that. Think about going out before that, and all you've got is a paper map. And you've got to try and work out where you are in this landscape. And some of, the, particularly um, sort of the south of the Clarewind, there are no features there, really. You, you, you're trying to find out where you are. You're sort of like, oh, there's a kink in the stream, and oh, I'm a bit away there. And, oh. So you can see why things ended up in the wrong place. It was also done at that early, earlier period in the early period of the Upland Survey, when some of the monument recognition, the actual recognition of sites, was still developing and still people were still learning about what things were. And so not all sites were picked up and some sites were attributed into a wrong category. Okay, um, so I think we've got some examples here. Sorry, this is just sort of um, showing the difference when you're dealing with bracken, trying to record things when you've got bracken over it, covering it, and um, millennia, that's, that's millennia purple moorgrass there. Um, and it does help, some of the Yellow and Lynx projects are dealing with mowing, tr seeing what difference mowing millennia makes from purple moorgrass. So you can sort of see here, there's an area that's been mown as, as with all things, you try to do something good and that may have other problems. Um, sometimes you can find the problem with mowing um, something like millennia or bracken means that you're ending up driving straight over earthwork monuments, which are then getting a bit damaged. The point about that is it means it's very important to know where your sites are exactly so that you know that's where the site is. I need to be careful there or I need to avoid it. It's no good if you think, here's the site, I need to avoid it, but it's actually there. So you avoid this bit, but you go over that bit and you create damage. And that's why it's so important to know where these things are in, in and, and this work in this database and why we're resurveying this area. Um, so what, just a couple of things about what we were particularly looking at incorrectly recorded sites, where they're recorded in the wrong location. Okay. Um, this site is uh, on the side of the Hrunant stream. It's very obvious. I hope you agree. Um, 
we can debate about exactly what it is, whether it is just a sheepfold or whether it's a long hut, a, a, a small stone structure living in somehow um, that has been used later as a sheepfold. But undoubtedly, there is a, a site there. Um, and you think, so anybody who'd been there previously could not have not seen that. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not in Bracken, it's not in Millennia, it's quite readily visible, it's got st stand, stone standing up. There was no record for this in this data set. And we, this was a good access point for us, so we went past this several times. And we kept looking at it and thinking, well, I don't know, where, where, what have they done? And, you know, we, it was a puzzle for quite a long time until one day we stopped going in this direction up here. This is where that site is, that blue circle. And we started going up this valley towards the mines. These are lead mines here. And we came across a record there. That was the record. We, we checked it. We checked it because there were, there were photographs with that record so we could see what the site looked like and it is the other site. So we, we've been very careful in making sure they match up because it's quite difficult to do a match if you've got differing descriptions. Um, but the rest of so the record for the site is 420 meters away from the site itself. So nobody can manage that site if you don't know where the record is. So this is the importance of the work that we've been doing to make sure things are in the right place. Um, and we're working on the data set now and so uh, there's a lot of robust work going to be done to check that we've got it right. I, I, there will always be mistakes in anything. Um, anybody who says there's no mistakes in anything is... <laughs> um, but we are going to do a very robust checking backwards and forwards to make sure that as far as possible we've got things in the right place. Um, the, and going back sort of to the monument recognition, and this is a very simple example of this, but it, it does cover the point, is that when the people previously were recording, they weren't recognising necessarily what things were, okay? Um, things change, things move on. We all learn things. The profession, archaeological profession learns things. Everybody learns things as we go on. And some of the early sites were not looked in, the, were looked at in a sort of odd way, potentially. You can get, and we all do this because we all focus on something. We read something in the paper or we read a book or somebody says something and you become really interested in that. Um, and this happens to archeologists as well. Um, so you've, you've read a paper about something and you suddenly start seeing them everywhere and you think, oh gosh, that's one, et cetera, et cetera. And we think that's probably what happened here. This is an aerial view of the um, tarstone quarries below Cregan Key. Okay. Um, the path that goes through the middle there that you can see here is, is this well-known, well-walked, well-cycled footpath. Okay. So a lot of people go through this area. The white patches are the spoil tips. Um, and as you can see, they're sort of scattered around. If you look at the, this is a bit like an optician's thing, look at the pink triangles first, pink triangles, okay? Those are the records that we had previously. That's what we started with. They were all records for shelters built by the Royal Ordnance Corps. Corps, okay? And we thought, that's odd, <laughs> don't know, but fair enough, we'll go there and have a look and have a see. Um, when we got there, that isn't what we found at all. For start, these, those records aren't actually on the right things, as you can see by the red stars. Look at the red stars now. The red stars are actually where the quarries are, for start. These shelters that were being recorded as being part of the Royal Ordnance are actually just part of the workings within the quarries. Um, you've got examples later um, where you can see these tidestone quarries, they work in quite, they, they get a lot of waste. Um, and so what they do is they build walls as partly shoring, revetting, reinforcing. 
So they build walls and they build themselves little shelters as well so that they can sit there and nap the stone and they're sheltered from the environment. So what was actually being recorded as these Royal Ordnance Corps shelters was actually uh, just part of the workings of the quarries. But the quar none of them were in the right place. And as you can see, if you, uh, it's a bit hard to see and you may not be able to see it. But the distribution of the white patches and then the red stars, we've now got it. I, I did put this over Google Earth so we could put the dots, the red stars over the top of Google Earth and they're now matching up in the right place. This is a simple example, but we found this time and time again um, throughout the survey. And it, it's, just a, it's just a factor of time, GPS not being right, sometimes monument recognition not being right. <sighs> Sounds a bit bragging, but we do have rather a lot of years between us of identifying things in the landscape. Um, and also, as you can see on the thing, we've worked at the sort of the length of Wales looking at things. So we know how things change regionally. Something somewhere may not look quite the same somewhere else. So we, we do have a lot of experience under our belt. We've made our mistakes too, and we've learnt. So we're quite happy now with making a good record, and that makes it easy to manage. People now, the Elan Links, Elan Valley Trust, after this, will know where the monuments are. And this is a simple example with the quarries, post-medieval, not maybe so important, but we've also done the same thing with um, medieval house sites and, and, and prehistoric sites as well, which Paul will come on to now, actually, if that's all right. <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Right. Um, like Jenny, I'm quite busty. This is a bit weird seeing people again. <laughs> it's been a long couple of years, but... I mean, Jenny's given you the background, okay, a little bit of an idea of, of why we were there. What I want to do is take you back through the period of time from, from modern, right back as far as we can go, to show you what, what it is we, we find, what, what it is that's hidden up in those hills. Um, sometimes it's hidden in plain sight, and we've been constantly finding things that everyone else literally has been walking past and just haven't noticed them. And it's, we get a buzz out of that, I've got to say, as field archaeologists. Um, but the range, and the, the, I think, to, to begin with, what I want to emphasise, and hopefully at the end of it you'll understand what I'm saying, I want you to go away, if nothing else today, to go away from this hall knowing that the uplands uh, uh, you know, of the Eland estate are one of the most heritage-rich, archaeologically rich landscapes you will ever see. They are off the scale, okay? It is so valuable, and it, it, it it, it, we often talk about these things in the hill, it, it, up on the hill. The lack of people experiencing what's up there is almost heartbreaking. There is so much there that people don't know about. And, and a lot of it is tough to get to, to be fair, in, in all honesty. We, you know, we, we, we're, we're over 30 now, so it's starting to get a bit tough on us as well. You know? But uh, yeah, but, but we'll see. So you have to forgive me with my slideshow. I'm trying to try to keep it under two hours, right? But I will take you back as fast as I can. That's a joke. I'm not going to take two hours. But they've got quite a lot of slides, and I'll skip through them fairly handily. But I just want to give you that flavour and show you the range of things that we're dealing with. OK, and uh, I'll pick up on a few issues as we go along, I'm sure. Okay. Right, military sites. OK, well, I think earlier on, we may have had mentioned of the Nantig Road Dam um, we've been talking about earlier. Um, the famous uh, dam that Barnes Wallace's team blew up. I mean, I don't hope you can see the photographs. The, the, the definition isn't very good on the screen, I'm afraid. Um, but the ruins of the dam are still there, you know, in preparation for the dam busters raid, raid, raid and all, all that. You know, they famously tested some of their explosive devices on this poor dam and blew it up. So we know about that and it's quite, you know, well researched. But what we don't know, what people didn't know, is that when you go up on the hills, there are other military sites that are forgotten. And uh, we can't explain them completely but we have got in our, under our belts the experience of doing field surveys on the Army Fire Rangers in centre and have had looked at Second World War earthworks there that relate to training in the Czech Army and so forth in, in mid-1940s, OK? So what Jenny's standing in there is, is, a, is a machine gun trench. It's, it's a seagull trench, OK? And on that hill... Sorry, this is um, closer to then, so we're to the west of the reservoir here, OK? Barnes Wallace's dam would be in view of this through those. If those trees were cut down, you'd be looking towards Nantigrow, really. You'd be looking back down 
towards the, the Elam Valley. But again, I hope you can see them. There's the masts up on Rossigalin, and many of you hope you'll be familiar with. Very difficult for you guys in the back. But you'll see these little dots, these little pimples. Oh, there's a little arc there. Diff diff difficult, there's more up there. They're all foxholes and machine gun uh, trenches. Now, in the firing posts. I, why are they there, we don't know. Training, possibly. They're very distinctive Second World War features. You don't find these post-Second World War. The methods changed. Now, I'd romantically like to think that they were put there deliberately as part of the whole network that was put in place to protect the dams because they were very concerned. Birmingham's a big city. The Germans could have blown those dams as the RAF later did to Germany. It would have made a big impact on British industry and blah, blah, blah. Yeah? So were they actually guarding the hills around? It's possible because you find odd features, odd trenches, odd sort of stone structures all over the hills. And we say, oh, it's the army. But we don't understand what's going on but these we do these are definitely second world trenches where they have you, you have to imagine where Jenny sat there you literally have to imagine that with with, with sandbags yes you know it's it, it would be built as a defensive point but you know so that, that's quite in, quite cool quite an interesting thing to find quite unexpected but then some of you may be familiar with a, an earlier bit of military history earlier 20th century with the Royal Artillery had a, a summer camp up in the Elenid Hills. And in Ryder, well, Ryder was the camp. But when they came to Ryder, they actually went up onto the hills and played around. One of our first surveys in this hills was over above Pont on um, uh, or, or above Aberglan here in Farmer on the hill there. We went to look at the Bronze Age Cemetery, okay? This was recorded, Bronze Age burial ground, where all these mounds, these cairns were, supposedly. And we got up on a foggy day and um, we almost re resigned and retired at that point because all we could see were hundreds of mounds, hundreds of them all over the hill, and it was foggy as well. You couldn't see very far. And we think, well, how on earth do we deal with these? And we started looking at them. We realised every mound had a hole next to it, and a lot of the mounds had bits of metal sticking out of them. You know, these aren't in. These were, these, it was an artillery range. This, these were the impact points where shells had been fired. You can go see them. It's just above Abergon here in Farm, all over the top of the hill. Later on, I mean Brian Lawrence, who's the local historian, knows quite a bit about this, and we did get information through him as well. What, what, it, what they relate to is pre-First World War artillery practice, and it's quite exciting stuff. It's quite advanced stuff if you're into that sort of thing. You know, for the first time, they were used doing radical things, like using balloons, for, as spotted in balloons to direct the artillery fire. So they'd be found blind from the other side of Pontarela, uh, Penry Wen, is it, is up on the top there? Okay, so they're firing blind over the hill with a, with a balloon spotted, telling them where they were, where, you know, I suppose semaphore or something, so they could then correct their fire. Really, you know, this is just pre-First World War. Um, the, the sad story is, they were, they, they, well, not so sad, I suppose, but on the eve of the First World War, they were practicing up with huge howitzers, brand new howitzers, very heavy duty guns. War broke out. They literally packed them on the train and uh, straight to the Western Front. You know, and that, the big... Oh, was it Big Bertha was the name of the big gun? It still survives. It's in a museum. It survived the war. But the interesting thing, when you go over Penrhu, when over the, the roads on the Comuspis Road, these, we've been up there. We thought these are, that's where the guns were. You can see the platforms where the guns were positioned. That's to the south of the road. There are more to the north of the road. There are two separate um, sites, actually. So, you know, there's Jenny. You can see the series of these, you know, little platforms. You can see where they, they rolled the guns in. You can also see the tracks where the wheels went in. It's a remarkable bit of history. I you know it really is quite, I find it exciting as a field archaeologist. You don't see that every day. Okay, I mean, it's not a use, particularly useful. Fact. That's in probably an early 20s, like 1900-ish, 1903, I think they started. But that's the sort of thing they were doing. They were rolling up for the summer with their guns, whether they were the sort of old-fashioned sort of cannon things, all big, more modern howitzers. And they parked up on the hill. And I think this is... Um, What's the name of the farm? I don't know. I won't forget it. I won't remember it. But anyway, I, I, I haven't been to that particular part of the hill myself, but um, it's outside our survey area. But th that's quite modern. That's 20th century, and that's a really interesting bit of archaeology. You know, I, I, I'm, I could go on a lot more, but I won't because time uh, would keep me here for a long time. So that's our 20th century. We look at industries then is another theme that you'll pick up on these hills, okay? Um, and I will say another thing, apart from the, the military stuff, but on these hills you'll find evidence of you know, people, how people worked, how people lived, and how people died, and how they buried, got buried. And that's the interesting thing about upland archaeology. It's all there. It doesn't get taken away by subsequent generations. 
So one of the really interesting industries, of course, is the water industry, and I won't blather on too much about it, because as Jenny said, we didn't study the reservoirs. That wasn't our job. But, the, you know, you're all familiar, the Clyde Wen and the Elan Dam. And, and they, as Jenny said, they get a lot of attention. The amount of people that drive up on their cars, their motorbikes, their bicycles, on foot, on horseback, whatever. People come from all over the world to visit them. But they don't look past them. They don't look past them. Because if you go to the side of the Clyde Wen Dam, we could look at this. This is a nice bit of archaeology. This is industrial archaeology. It's, it's that sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, really, like, not a ramp, it's, it's where the cranes were stood th when they built the dam, okay? You, you go to these reds, but either side on the hills, you can see all the stuff left where they were actually, they had pylons or cranes or surveying points, whatever, it's all still there. And that's archaeology, you know, from our point of view. So in, that's the dam in construction. You see the cranes there, the big cranes? They're in that gully. They, they trundled back and forth along that gully. So that's a nice little bit of modern industrial archaeology. Um, the Elan, you know, famously, Ostis Tickel, you may not be able to see in that photograph there, outside the engineer, uh, the, the, oh, the engineer's hut. One of the few, probably the last surviving huts of the whole enterprise. This is where the engineers would basically design some of these dams. You know, the house is sitting there, ro sort of rotting away, sadly. But um, I'd like to think it will be saved. I mean, th th it's not won't be for lack of will. I mean, people would like to do something with it. Um, and then you go along the, the Eildon, along the valley, and you've got the old railway, OK? Like, so that's a field archaeology to us. And it's now popular with walkers and cyclists. But what's really nice is, is Jenny is standing on a bridge. You know, this lovely, lovely, lovely sort of early, late 19th, early 20th cent century railway architecture. There's, there's loads of it. It's, it's around you everywhere. Um, and sometimes you just get off the path to see it. The roads that people drive around all the time, these beautiful bridges that were built at the same time. You know, it's, it's, it's astounding. The, you know, the built heritage of the, of the, of the valley is so rich. This, and this is, these are fine structures. These are, these are, you know, in another place, you might list them, I guess, but I suppose you would here. So, so, th so there's that. That's a fairly recent thing. I mean, again, we're quite familiar with that. Go back a little bit further to the, to the lead mining of the area, okay, which is so poorly documented. You've got you know, some fascinating sites here, some really, really impressive sites. The Coma Island mine being one of the earliest and obviously very closely associated with the Coma Island estate. Quite a profitable, profitable mine in its, in its early history. Most of them were not profitable and they made terrible losses and conned a lot of people out of a lot of money, to be frank. But... Um, but the Elan, yeah, the, that's the later workings at the Elan, Coma Elan mine. There are earlier workings that I won't go into now, but they're dotted around. There are, there's some of the early, so late 18th, early 19th century workings you can also pick out. But these, these have made this huge imp impact on, on society. Before the dams, you had a lot of miners in the area. You know, the, the social change that came with them was, is, is an interesting thing. People, you know, men come from Cornwall to work in the valley and so forth. Um, but you've got, you know, you've got Coma Elan site, you've got... The ones I can never remember, Dalhu, Nantikar South, Nantgaru mine at the top, Nantgaru mine at the top, down in the Runat Valley, south of the Clyde I mean, what an amazing landscape. And these mine complexes are sitting there, you know, like time has stopped. And there's so much we can learn from them. They're so interesting, they're so peaceful. The histories are, are, are quite, quite dramatic in some of them and quite tremendous. You can still walk the miners' trackway, more or less. It's a little bit rough in places. And one piece has collapsed completely down into the valley, but you can get around it. It's like a, it's like going on the Inca Trail in Peru, I'd imagine. You know, it's 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 great. It's it's fantastic. But you know, they built that from those lower mines up to the Nantigaru mine, and you can walk in the footsteps of these miners. You know, now, and then you go. That's the Nantigaru mine, which very few people get to. I suspect it's, the photo is not the best, but the, it's a chimney standing. The toxic waste tips are still there. Everyone have your picnic on those. And you can see, actually, as you go down the slope, there's a lot of the landscape has no vegetation. It's been poisoned. I think they're probably hushing. They probably washed the soil off 100, over 100 years ago. Sad little mine were forced to abandon production because of the Eland Dams scheme, because they knew they would poison the river. So they were basically had a gun put to their head and told to stop. And they were very unhappy about it. But I don't think it would make any money, to be honest with you. And you've got you know, this lovely um, the magazine, the gunpowder, the powder magazine, the explosive magazine for that mine is up there. The, the, the track I was showing you is running up there on, the, on that slope. Um, Nantikar South mine is down in the bottom of the valley. 
And what I love about this little, you know, this well away from the mine, obviously for safety reasons, it's beautifully built. And I just love the little white cross they've built into the front as well. It's quite symbolic, isn't it? It's, you know, a little touch. Whoever built it put a little white cross in. Now, whether that was, you know, a warning sign or a religious sign, I don't know. But um, so again, then, but like with, with the reservoirs, you go away from the mines and you go in the hills above and you find all the other stuff the miners were doing. They didn't just come and dig holes and get lead out. All around the hills above, you get trenches like this. They were digging trenches to try to prove the rock to see if they could find more ore. And you'll find these random pr prospecting trenches in so many different places. And you can, you know, I was, I, I'm quite surprised with some of them. They're a long way from the mines. They were trying to find more mi mineable ore wherever they could because they, w they wanted to make a lot of money out of it. Um, and that's a nice shot. I mean, Penabont, Penabont restaurants around behind the trees there. So that will be that reservoir name I can never remember, um, the middle one. Um, and anyway, Teen Lidiot, the, the little house is there. So we're nowhere near a mine really here, but there's another one, these prospecting trench, a nice big tip there, they've been working there, you know, fairly random, you don't expect to come across it. And we, we find it exciting as archeologists, to be honest with you, okay. And then you've got other little things, minor quarries, you know, all the houses, those old houses in the valley, they were built from stone mine quarried in the valley, you know. Um, and I, that's true of all the whole country, and certainly in Wales that I know. It's amazing how, how people, I think, in, in the past were very good at using the resources they had, which is something we are not doing. Um, there's a big argument about how we develop our society in the future. But you want to build a house, go up the hill, you can get some stone. Farmers still do it today. All farms have got a quarry if they can get one, if they've got a bit of stone. You, you, you get your own stone. So that's, that's the beautiful, that's the Runant Valley there going up to the mines we were just looking at. That is my favourite place in the whole, that's Nant Paradois, Paradise Valley. What a beautiful name, eh? But it's got a quarry in it, you know, and it's got a few other things. It's quite interesting. And then we've got the massive quarries where the Clyrowen Dam, the stone for the Clyrowen Dam was quarried, which is a little bit... But again, further uh, south of the Clyrowen, south of Dolomanach. Um, I haven't got a photograph of you, but you go there and you can still see the huge blocks of stone dressed, ready to go to the dam that they never used. They're still sort of at the side of the path, the last load that they never picked up. Um, so these things have had an impact, you know. And these are the, this, is the, this is the site that Jenny was talking about, the um, uh, Kriegin Key quarries. These are, these are tile stone quarries. These are much older. I mean, when Thomas Grove had the Comailan estate, and after he'd sold it, actually, a bit later, there are adverts for the sale of the estate, and amongst the possessions of the Cormelan estate are tilestone quarries. Now, th I've, I've found no documented history of this, this, this quarry complex, but I can only assume that it's one of these early, late 18th, early 19th century quarries. Uh, if you look at the rock face on the site, you can still see where the chisel split the rock, and as Jenny said, you can still see where the men sat to cut, to dress the rock. Um, this is uh, Dolvoli, similar thing. Tina Thidiat House is down there again just down, down the valley from Penbont, from the restaurant. Another lovely, uh, beautiful site. Th this wasn't recorded. I mean, you talk about the Creek and Key one, there was no record of these quarries before we got there, which was quite unbelievable. Yet, the little shelters that the, the quarrymen built with, I, I can imagine sitting to get shelter, and also because the, spot, the fine spoils around them, I think this is where they actually split the rock and threw the waste away. Those were recorded as military observation posts. I can't explain it, but but they're not anymore, put it that way, the record's been corrected. But again, you know, the quality of the landscape, the I mean, the views from up there, everything about these places, not just historic, it's absolutely stunning. Okay, so we've done fairly modern things. Start working backwards a bit and then look at a different theme, which is where people lived, okay? A couple of, this is a big theme, a really big theme, because one thing I, 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 I spend most of my life in the, in the mountains, I've learnt, is the human landscapes. They're not natural, they're not as God intended as it were. People look and say, oh, it's nature. It is not nature. It is a human landscape full of houses, full of people. We know some of them are quite famous, and you go to Dolomanach and you get this beautiful, um, presum <coughs> originally 15th century, they say at the core, uh, house at Llanachacau, which the estate rents out as a holiday uh, let. Um, you get Tien Thidda, which you've seen and mentioned a few times. There's those quarries at Dolvola, just up there on the other side, by the way. Um, again, the estate. Uh, one thing I will say in favour of the estate is a lot of these places wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the existence of the estate. And a lot of upland areas in Wales don't have this because these places have gone. So, you know, the, 
there's a heritage benefit for the tourism that exists because a large number of the farms end up like this and this is true of the more remote parts of the estate it's here stable case i'm famous and i'm old enough to remember the chimney on it it's not that long ago it's recently uh, come down isn't it but we've got these farms dotted around and these are the farms these are, these are the symbols of the society that, w w that was there before the dams and the histories of the, each of those farms is fascinating. That excellent book on the Elan Clearances, which was uh, published a few years ago, documents quite a lot of these places. And we haven't got time to discuss them, but they're great stories. But then the dams came and everything changed, obviously. I just, I, this one, I love this, because when we're going up to the, the, the Clywen quarries, I can't remember the name of the valley, I must admit, the Marshland, possibly. And we noticed this lovely um, Elan sort of, uh, this, the, the dam scheme. They built these cottages, didn't they, for the, for the dam keepers and for the, the staff that maintained the system after they were constructed. And it's such a beautiful little cottage up in the hills there, it's tucked away. And I got a photograph of another beautiful little cottage because they were built, this is a different one, but they're, al they're almost identical, okay? And see, that other, the second one was above Nanta Gro, uh, just up the valley from Nanta Gro Dam. And uh, that's the site today. That one didn't make it sadly, but you wouldn't know that it was so recent. That house was only built just over a century ago, and it's already and it's long been knocked down. But so we get used to working with these ruins, okay? Um, Pantatin, there's Ryder in the distance there. This is on this side of the mountains, as it were. Um, uh, just again, these, these fragments, you know, this was lived in in the 20th century. There's a great story of a, uh, was it a Polish airman was shot, was crashed his plane. And the occupant of Pantagos, because the Second World War, and the occupant took him at sort of um, pitchfork point, marched him to the police station, didn't believe he was Polish, claimed that he was German. Poor Paul. But, but there's someone living there then. It's how quickly these things go, you know. It's the blink of an eye, isn't it? Um, above Dolvola quarries, um, just a, 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 there is a name for it, I can't remember. So, uh, yes, it's, it's good, these things go. Pan, I don't know. No, anyway, Kerdin, Pantakerdin. Pantakerdin, um, 19th century it was lived in, it's long abandoned. Um, this one is to the west of the reservoir. It's a barn, it's not a house. No, that, it's Llanerchi, that is, Llanerchi Wood. It's above the church, okay? It's been forested, the forestry is, you know, obviously the houses were abandoned, the forest came in. But each one of these places has got stories. This is the interesting thing. You can look at the tithe maps, you can look at the census returns, you can look at all different sources. You can build up pictures of who lived and who farmed and who did what. The tremendous heritage potential of each one of these is, is great. A, a, a Sewing Vale house, which was the Runant Valley there, the, the, co the, the mines I looked at earlier um, were just up Dalhru and the Nantakara just up the valley. Um, there are photographs of people standing up to this one, if I remember rightly, but it's, you know, 19th century. Again, there were people living there. I loved about this one was at the corner of the garden is the old oven. It's still intact. We had to take some tin sheet in away and cut the bracken down to see it properly. Uh, but uh, this is the time where the bracken's dead, but it's just starting to grow. This is about a May, and it's it's, this is where our life starts getting hard. But these little details, all uh, these places have got these fabulous little details. Uh, just, I'm sorry, I'm being very random with this, but I, I find this particular interesting. Siest um, Kumbach, yeah, which I'd never been to until we did this survey. It's not easy to get to, but I was very glad to get to. It started raining, so you can go in and sit down and have a cup of coffee. So it, it, it works as a bothy very nicely. But the Siest, the you see, is a, a thing I'm very interested in, because I don't know how, many, how familiar you are with the whole story of the Havod and the Hendra in Medville, Wales. The, the Havods were the houses on, they lived in in the summer on the hills. And the, the, the Hendra were the houses they occupied in the sum, in the winter down in the valleys. Well, after the Havard and Hendra system broke down in the 16th century, Upland Wales got the Thiest system, which is a different thing. These are permanent shepherding st stations. These are where the shepherds lived, okay? And they dotted around. Thiest Combat's a, a good example. It's, it's cut off because of the reservoir now, but it wouldn't have been so remote originally, of course. But you've got Thiest, uh, the other one, Thiest Trehesklog, I think this one is called. Uh, just to the south of the Rio de Comustus Road, with its little potato plot, its little garden plot next to it. Very often they would have a little garden, they would just grew some root veg, potatoes to keep themselves going. Um, lived very poor lives, a lot of these people, but they weren't completely cut off, because I remember up uh, Estedva Gierig, which is over towards Pont Erwin in Ceredigion, talking to a farmer up there who had a CS site I went to look at some years ago, and, and he was old enough to remember an elderly lady from Pontypridd coming to visit it in the 1950s, 
she wanted to see her father's birthplace, which was an amazing story. And she could tell this farmer the story of how her family lived in Cleest, and that they were very poor, they had no money, but, but her, her mother would take a basket full of eggs to Pont Edward Market uh, once a week to try to get a few shillings in, in as it were. Um, so these places are going back a little bit further now. We're going back maybe 18th, 17th, 16th, well, 16th to 18th centuries, the age of the Cleest. They start tri dying by the 19th century. But, but the stories are there. The, this tradition is a very important one, and they're very much associated with the shepherding of the sheep coming into the hills, replacing the earliest in the Havon and Hendra was horses, cows, sheep, geese, the whole shebang. Cleest is very much about shepherding, more about shepherding than anything else. So, but we've got these dotted around the hills. He said, trying not to get off point. Cleest Abakaithan, you go past Cleest Abakaithan and off piste a little bit, and you'll come to the earlier houses. Cleest Abakaithan is quite modern. It's, it's not the original farm there at all. Um, I won't remember the name of this one. It's not, but it's Cleest Collector. Yeah, Cleest Collector. Um, the, again, this is going back to, this was occupied in the mid 19th century. We got, it was gone by the late 19th century. Um, all these places, again, they've got stories, they've got people associated with them, they've, they've got things we can say about them. And each one of these farms and cottages around them have got field systems and tracks. And all this is Blind Coil, this is the um, ruined farm at Blind Coil, again, which survived into the well into the 20th century. I think it was abandoned after the dams or after the dams were built. But it's not just the house we look at, it's the whole landscape around it, because they just sit in the middle of their fields. And they, 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 there's a system around them. Yeah? They're not just random, like we live in cottages today and we watch telly and then that's when you go to Tesco's in the car. These people didn't. This was their world. This, this, they got their food off that and they had to make it work. You know? And if you go to Black Coil and follow the boundary bank around there, it's huge. It's a massive earthwork, okay? Uh, which I think it makes it, it's going back a long way, I suspect. It's quite... It, it's quite a bit earlier than it's given credit for. Um, so those are things we are familiar with, farms, cottages. We see them, even the CS sites, we recognise them as, as houses, I think. But then we go back further, we go into that, some platforms, we go into a different world, because one of the things that's common with all the buildings I've just shown here, they're stone-built, or brick-built, sometimes, but they're stone-built. Stone building only happens when you've run out of trees, yeah? Because earlier people had plenty of forest, well, natural woodlands in these valleys. They had fine oak woodlands to, to, to use to build their houses. And they did something very different. So we, this is the big find from, our, from this particular survey, the, the Rees survey in particular, is all these medieval houses we found that no one's ever noticed. And there's a fine example there. You can see it, can't you? Because it was a wooden house. There's nothing left. There's no ruin. See that? Jenny's there. That thing there is, is the platform on which the, the wooden house was built, okay? The repair of them. That now is just, oh, Jen, help me. Um, we're looking north. That is, it's not from here and Nantes, it's just over the, t over the way. And, uh, yeah, but, but we, no, I, I, names, I, I, there's so many names, I, I can't remember all this. Escarbrithgum, that's the word. Escarbrithgum, to the west of the reservoirs again. But these are really exciting because, you see, these were houses that were built before the trees ran out. And I, I've, seen letter, I've seen one particular letter from, from North Carmarthenshire written in the late 1600s where a, a tenant is appealing to the, the lady of the Edwinsford estate, please let me b build my new house in stone because there's no timber left. Okay, so we're getting to that sort of, you know, 1700-ish, they've run out of timber, they've cut it all down. They do say the Spanish Armada, 1688 and all that, they cut so many trees down to build the navy, they ran out of the best woods, the best forest. I don't know if that's true, but they say that. This is um, Jenny, there's a, there's a platform there. There's another one there. Um, that's Nanty Growth. So the Barnswater's Dam is just down the bottom there, okay? That's Knuch, I think, that hill there. There's two lovely house sites there. Big platforms. They're quite the photos don't do them justice. This is the problem. You need to, you know, it's very difficult for some of these places. But you, when you get to them, these are big earthworks. These are really fine earthworks. Archaeologically, they're probably completely intact as well. Um, when the bracken comes, it gets a bit harder. But as Jenny said, the bracken follows the contour. So we are, are pretty adept at spotting them in, in bracken. You can see the shape of them. But that flattened area there, it, it's all they do. They, they cut into the slope and draw the soil forwards to create a level platform, and then you build a timber house in it. So if, as an archaeologist, if you excavated that now, you would find where the posts went in around the wall to, to support the walls. You would um, 
some, found the hearth, inter maybe some stone pads and some stone internal divisions. You'd find the archaeology, but it would be intact without any doubt. So, you know, there's, uh, sorry, Kanaka Kaura is just there, and Dolomanach Reservoir. Um, so, but th none of these were recorded, none of these were seen, and things were recorded all around them. But when I say, when, as Jen was saying, when people did these surveys 20, 30 years ago, 30, 35 years ago, um, they were looking at the landscape differently. Since, late, since about 1999, 2000, in Wales, we've completely redefined our terminology and the way we look at archaeology and landscape. So we've got that benefit of that knowledge. Now we, we see things differently. Not the best photographs. It's looking towards Dola Manak and um, Tlanaka Kaura, the famous 15th century house, yes? Dola Manak, the meadow of the monks. Bearing in mind, the thing I'm missing here, all these hills were owned by Stratoflora Rabi, weren't they, in, in, in the Middle Ages. Massive wool production, sheep, they did have sheep everywhere, but they also had horses and geese and other things. So we all know about Tlanaka Kaura, the 15th century house that everyone goes on. You won't see this very well, okay, I'm afraid, because this, this is a long way off from the hill opposite. There's a little blob in the field there. That's another medieval house site. So forget Tlanaka Kaura, that's an earlier house. Okay? It's quite a big platform. So that fees, fees, you know, the 15th century is probably coming to tenants, uh, building, farming, at the end of the monastic tradition. But this timber structure would be in the middle of the monastic period. Okay? This is, if there were monks f you know, farming here, that's the sort of place they'd be operating from. Um, not a very good photograph. It's almost impossible to photograph, but you can just see that darker blob. That's the, f the house there. There's Sanaka Kao. I would say in that field behind the trees there, there's another platform. Okay, so this archaeology, people have been wandering past this continually, because we're obsessive about these things. We, and you know, we 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 look for them and we find them. Um, no, I just I, I the, the that's Pantathin. Sorry, yeah, Pantathin. You can't see it it's in behind the trees there, but there's a lovely big platform there again. They just pop up, and uh, so you may well be dealing with the Havel tradition here. Okay, now you're going back maybe 12th, 13th century, or even earlier, possibly. It's, it's hard to be certain. Examples have been excavated in other parts of the country. They tend to come out to the 12th century. It's very difficult to date these things. Very, very few of them get excavated. Okay, very random thing. But so in every area, you find there is sometimes you find slight differences to the way people be built houses in the past. Again, because they're very resourceful people, and they built to suit themselves. They didn't have to go to the planning department. I need a house, I need a garden, I need to do it. And then you just did what you could do to suit your own purposes. So it's fine. I mean, Vic, Dave, all credit, you've spotted this before us. Beautiful big bank. And as I say, look, there's the Y Valley below. And we looked at this, and it was low sunlight. The archaeologists love dead vegetation, low sunlight. We're out till sunset because we can see things then. And we think, well, where's the house? Where's the house? It's obviously someone's got a paddock here. Where's the house? And oh, sorry, more to the point. Where's the, what's, why is this open? Why is that? And we spent quite a bit of time doing wandering around, and the sun kept going down. As the sun went down further, bingo, there's the house. Can you see it? So th it wasn't an open enclosure. The house blocked that side, but it would have been a timber house. Okay? So if we'd been there in summer with the bracken up in midday, we would not have seen it. It would have been invisible. And, you know, so it's just luck. And we are slightly mad, but we do go out at 11 in, in the morning and stay out until it's dark because it's that last few hours of the day that gives you what you need. We come off many mountains in Torchland, haven't we, Jen? And then, well, the Penbont restaurant's just there. Penagaric Reservoir's there. So there's a, a very steep path that goes up to the hill to the east of Penbont. Look at that. Bank. This is the other end of the hill from where we just were, okay? So this is a local thing, isn't it? Someone said, well, I've done one of those. Do you want to do what I did? And Jenny's standing on the end of the house. So the house would have been there, a platform, basically. Dating those is very difficult. I, my feeling with that would be probably 16th century, a little bit later, 16th, 17th century. I'm just saying that because I, I don't know but uh, no, one, no one has actually excavated them. But I think they're, they're, they're more complicated than the, the, the straight platform. Not so obvious this one. Um, that, that dam, um, the one that's been repaired, Craigdorf, yeah. This is where you can see the water's starting to dry up in the summer. Hirnant Farm is just behind us. As you drive, as everyone does, past Hirnant down the valley, what you, if you look just to your right, you can't see very clear in the photograph. It was not easy to photograph, but from there, to probably about there, there's a beautiful, huge earth platform. Again, there would have been a timber house there. You know, these things are just right in front of us. And we've been driving that road for 10, 12 years. And this year we saw, oh, look at that. 
just happened to see it. There are other buildings from the period uh, uh, which are have stone components, right? They're medieval. They have got stone foundations, but probably had timber upper walls, okay? And they were all thatched roofs, of course. Uh, Tyrone in the distance is it's along the, the southern side of the Clarion Valley. There are so many of these medieval house sites. They, they, they're clusters and groups of little villages, okay? They, there are people all along that valley. It's an empty valley full of sheep. Um, you go to any valley in the uplands out there, pretty much any valley, you get a sheltered spot, you know, with a bit of sun on it, you'll find where a shepherd or a herdsman has built his hut. You may, you may find groups of them. Um, I haven't got photos of them today, but we'll often find with them, you'll find what we call a sunken shelter, which is basically a medieval fridge. Because in the Harvard Hendry system, they were producing milk, cheese, butter up in the hills. In the summer, think about it, milk, cheese, butter in the summer in the hills. How on earth do you preserve it? What they did, near these houses, you always find close by, I stupidly haven't got a photograph of one actually. They cut a, cut a trench, they'd line it with stone, put a thatched roof over it, so it's like a subterranean sort of chamber, and you can put things to keep them cool. That's the theory. Um, just a random, again, you just find these remains of these houses, stone, stone foundation, and they would have had timber walls, thatched roof, okay? Just when you're up in the hills, look out for them. It, doesn't, it almost doesn't matter where they are at, at some point. Um, and just finally on this theme, um, uh, over by Clyde Dam again, uh, the Kerikopla farm, just to the side of the house. When you get on the rock above to the uh, southern side of the dam, is it? The western side of the dam. It's one, two, three house sites there with stone foundations, medieval houses. Again, there's a settlement there. It's, it's pinging out, it's everywhere, you know, so it's, it's fantastic. Um, right, going back further now. And getting close to the point where I'll say I've nearly finished. The Romans are really interesting there because there's hardly anything of them, is it, Dave? Now, David, I'm going to sh give credit to for this next photograph. It's his. Uh, Escar Pervez, uh, with, with your lovely drone, got this great photograph in low light of the Roman marching camp. Okay, right there, getting his sort of there, I think. Okay, really, really nice site. A big Roman marching camp, quite fine. Uh, now, weirdly, and uh, uh, it's going to stick in my memory forever because one of the strange occurrences during our survey was that David James managed to get himself COVID and he was not too good for a while. And then the day he was feeling better he, he, um, was the day after we found... Uh, if you can see this, I don't know. That Roman fort's up on the hill there, okay? Now, oh gosh, I can't... So the definition not good enough, okay? You have to take me. But just there, Jenny's standing next to a big bank which is running there, right? Maybe, just trust me, it is there. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm missing one. You may just about be able to see it crossing there. It's very difficult to see. It's very difficult to photograph. But what it does, it runs there and it curves around and goes back there. It's got that classic Roman curve to its corner, the playing card shape corner. The bank that goes down the valley, I follow for 180 metres and it seems to curve again. Okay, so it's possible there's a second Roman marching camp here. We can't prove it because peat cutting or turf cutting to that side of it has kind of flooded or wiped out the, the landscape to an extent. We wait on our next year. There's new LIDAR coverage, you know, the, the LIDAR stuff coming up for the whole of Wales next year, and that may show what's going on here. But it's possible there's either a practice camp or, or, an, or a second marching camp, Roman marching camp, just hiding there, just near Escarpervet itself. But we'll see on that one. I had to put that in because that's potentially one of the most important things we've, we've found. In. Okay, prehistory. We are getting to the final chapter of this story. Prehistory, like with the houses where people lived, where people were buried is a totally different thing. And it's an odd thing. As you go through time, when it's into the medieval period, we see where people lived. When you go back in time to prehistory, we don't know where they lived. We see where they buried the dead, but where they live, we have to guess by and large, okay? So looking down from, from sort of Dolomana, who's out of sight there, you're looking back there towards the Elon. This is a common site. You get nice cairns, Bronze Age cairns, okay? So these are going to be three, three and a half thousand, four thousand years old. They will, underneath there, there will be a burial of a cremation of one or more people. Um, they, they cut a kist, a box into the ground, put the cremated uh, remains in an urn, stick it in that, build the mound over it, okay? There are variations on that theme. But these are like amongst the most important th uh, things in the landscape. Um, very often seen on the high ground, and you'll see some, and you'll see them from a long way away. Very obvious things on the high ground. 
but that, that pre sorry, to go back to the previous one, this is the interesting thing about them. Some of them clearly were not located to be seen. That isn't prominent from anywhere. What, what's interesting about it is it's a view to the valley. It's, it's view, the view from it is the important, not the view to it. And the same with this, the second one. Can you see it? It's actually the bracket. This is see the difference with brackets. This is a difference, right? There's the um, whatever the bottom there's about it. The, looking back towards the church, would be just up down there. Not Grist would be just in the corner there. There's a massive stone cairn there, but we couldn't see it because the bracket came up by this later part of the, of, of, of the spring or the early summer. You see some of the stone there, but I'm on a. It, it's in a hollow. It's completely hidden in the landscape. Okay, so whoever is buried then, whoever built it. They wanted that view to that point in the valley. For, so that is that telling us where they were living? Is this a significance to it, isn't it? We, I, I, we can't explain, but we can guess. And again, you'll go out there. This is Ross, huh, Ross Galenin, I believe that would be. Ross Galenin, yes. Um, purple moor grass, look what it does. It, it, it covers it. It's like a, like a tide coming in. It kills it, and it will break that up. It will pull it apart with the roots. Because I mean, I've seen, we've, there are areas up around Cloudwen, I've, you lose Jenny because the purple moss is so deep that she's, uh, you know, that's how bad it gets. And this is fairly new growth. This, the, these are under threat because this, this grass will rip them apart. But you know, they've got these smaller sites and they, they occur in groups and clusters. There's so many of them, there are, there are hundreds of them. So the Bronze Age people uh, d buried their dead all over the place. And even in 2022, we can go to Esker Brithgum and we can find that an unrecorded intact Bronze Age bar, which is huge. That is, that's Jenny standing next to it. That's not like a, a funny camera angle or anything like that. It's taller than Jenny. It's a big mound. Previously unrecorded. Um, it, in an area that had been surveyed, but it, it hadn't been picked up for reasons that I can't explain. Um, here and Ant Farms in the distance there, but they're looking north. A wrecked Bronze Age cairn, which was recorded as a medieval house. But it's clearly a Bronze Age cairn. We, we, we'd been there previously and weren't sure but what it is there's a field boundary built that runs through there and they've taken the stone off the cairn to build the field boundary so they've they've, they've ruined it um you want this very well i'm sure but that's that's uh Trehescoga, that's up by pa pantathin isn't it um that's those stones in the hollow i think no, there's a slight barrow a slight cairn there and that's the burial kist was exposed in the center it's been opened at some point in the past by a curious shepherd or some local vicar looking for treasure, possibly. Okay, so you'll find them open sometimes like that. Um, uh, we've got better photographs than that, and we haven't put them in today. And you get other random Bronze Age uh, funerary sites or ritual sites. Jenny's there. You can, ve with the eye of faith, you can just see a circle, a, a, a feature there. That's what you call a ring barrow or a ring cairn. So it's just a, it's like a, it's like a donut. It's a ring of stone, and the burial would be in the middle. Okay. Um, there's no there's no mound over it now. Whether there ever was an earth mound that's blown away in the wind, we don't know. But you've got to be quite fleet-footed because these things will come at you, and they're all different shapes and sizes, you know, and they're not always easy to see. You get your standing stones, very few with standing stones. There's a couple on hilltops, which we believe are Bronze Age. And again, the stone marks a cemetery. There will be cremation burials around it, okay, scattered around the, the, the landscape. Um, nobody's ever excavated in a place like this, so we don't know exactly what's going on. And the weirdest thing is that you'll find fabulous standing stones that clearly once were standing stones then, but they're not anymore. They've long fallen. And we know they were standing stones because the hole at, with the stone packing is still there at one end. Okay, so it's a reasonable thing to say it was originally. That's um, uh, Grow Hill, isn't it? Um, so, which is, Grow Hill is probably one of the richest Bronze Age landscapes in the area. It's packed, 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 packed with 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 cairns and all sorts of stuff and standing stones. This isn't Grow Hill, this is to the south of the Clower and up on the high ground. Um, I, I won't for one minute remember the name of this. A bron big Bronze Age cairn at the top, ruined, and then someone's built a pyramid of stone on top of it later on. Huge slab of stone again, which we looked at. And it is recorded, actually, as a, as a standing stone. And again, the telltale thing is that there's the hole in the packing stones at one end. It does seem to be genuine. So there are things out there that are not in pristine condition. You wouldn't, you might walk past them and think there's nothing of them, but um, but checking them against the point. And again, with a lot of these, the grid references were wrong, so they, they weren't recorded in the right place. Even if it's 50 meters out, it makes a lot of difference when you get you get uh, intrepid walkers going to look for something, and they've got their map and their GPS, and they come, so they've got it all, and they get to the place where the standing stones have been. It's not there. How frustrating is that? We need to put them in the right place. 
um, Bolchadoy Van, one of my favourite places I discovered. This is on the southern boundary of our area. There's the Brecon Beacons in the distance, okay? Fat Abergwest and Common. This is right on our southern boundary. This is as far south as we went, wasn't it? These two stones, Bolchadoy Van. Well, Bulkhad it's actually Bolchadoy Van. It should be Doy Van, but I won't go into the Welsh of that. But Bolchadoy Van, clearly what we call a stone pair. A bit like a standing stone, smaller but they have a ritual significance. We presume something to do with burials, but it may be something to do with gateways from one landscape to another. We, we, again, we can't be certain these things. Lovely pair of stones there. I mean, I haven't got a range in rod. They're quite small. They're only about sort of yay high, the tallest one. Um, but, you know, these things are, again, this, this landscape is full of prehistoric activity. Um, back over at Pantathlin on the, the eastern side of the area, the Treheskog stone alignment, several stones set in the line. Stone alignment's another characteristic Bronze Age, uh, sort of ritual monument. We don't fully understand why they were interested in building stone lines, but they did. Um, uh, I'm not a prehistorian, by the way, so I don't understand them. Hrosa Galenin, one of the best stone uh, alignments you'll get in a landscape packed with cairns and burials and ring barrows. Okay, Rosa Glennon, I think vies with Draw Hill in some ways, because, but the quality of these monuments is, is very high. This, this, you don't see these very often, you know, they're not common. But, you know, this line of stone, it's been disturbed over the years, obviously. One nice stone still standing. We assume there's some ritual practice going on. We, we, again, I, I'm not going to go into it. You, you, there's a people who write books about these things, and I, I, I don't know what the truth is. We, we weren't there when they did it, but they had a, obviously a very good reason for doing it. And even when we're following our boundary stones across the landscape, and they're very good, we follow them, we know where we are when we're following the boundary. Um, th no, is that concrete 1913 concrete boundary post being put there because there's a bronze stone pair, or are the stones put there to mark the boundaries to so they know where to put the concrete post? I don't know. But clearly, um, the two stones have nothing to do with the boundary post. I mean, I'd like to think they're bronze age, I don't, I don't know. As for both for archaeology, I always say, I don't know, because very often we really don't know. There's so many things we don't know. You won't see this very well, but this is back on Grow Hill. The famous Grow Hill, the Stone Circle. Um, it isn't called Grow Hill Circle. It's got another name. I can't think what the official name of it is. It's very small stones, but definitely a stone circle. And, you know, if you again go back to what I said about Grow Hill, there is such a concentration of prehistoric monuments there. It clearly was very important in prehistory. But where did they live? Ugh, don't know. Or do we? The Hunat Valley is there. So we're heading, looking back towards sort of riders in that direction in the lower part of the Valley. Um, now then, uh, yes, yeah, um, this, this hill above the Hunat, we've got a settlement site where the, uh, several circular hut foundations, okay? Could be a Bronze Age, could actually be a Bronze Age settlement. This could be one of the places they lived. Could be Iron Age. It's never been excavated. Could be Neolithic. Could, we don't know. Could be could be medieval. Geraldus Combert <coughs> has said that the medieval the people of medieval Wales lived in circular houses. I've never seen evidence to to, to, to show that, but I don't know. Without archaeological excavation, we'll never know. But that one was recorded. It's a scheduled monument. But even when we we visited it, we found another one that wasn't recorded within the group or just to the side of the group. You know, there's always m even sites that are well known and scheduled. There's more to find very often because it may depend on the time of year you go, the light, the vegetation, you'll see different things. Um, and then Crow Hill, th th not the best shot, and a very difficult one to photograph, but a very distinct circle of stones with an entrance. So I think, we believe, that that's a Bronze Age hut circle, okay? And that's the first one that would have been found on Crow Hill. Um, I can't prove it, uh, we'd have to excavate it. One of the fun frustrations has been a field archaeologist is you see these things and you talk about them, but we don't get to excavate them, so we never actually know the answers, I'm afraid. Right, my final chapter, very short final chapter, and I will stop. There, is a t there are other things before prehistory that are interesting to us, okay? And this is particularly important to the Lenneth Hills, and that's the peats, okay? The, the peats are in the 20 22nd, 21st century, or 21, 21st century, amongst the most important resources of the hills. But they're also archaeology, they're also heritage, okay? Because the peat bogs we've got strewn all over the Lenners are mostly in good condition, and they're still alive, they're still growing and very often. But in those deposits is locked the entire environmental and human history of the, the region, okay? The pollens, the, the evidence of human activity, it's all locked up in the layers that have built up over thousands of years, since, since the Bronze Age at least, since 
They started forming in the later Bronze Age, at the time when these cairns were being built, pretty much. So, um, that's actually um, Pantothene, isn't it? I think uh, that was the pond, the, the lake at Pantothene. Again, Ryodo would just be out of sight of the distance now. Um, but, you know, this is uh, somewhere in the middle of it all. So again, to the west of Penbont Restaurant, the east of Penbont Restaurant is the closest I could give you, uh, above Dolvoli. A big peat bog, so wet that you can't cross it. A really healthy peat bog, really. Um, we just keep running into them. This is another good reason for doing our field work in the winter, especially cold winters, because you can walk across and they freeze. Because like the rest of the year, you've got to walk around and you just, it's impossible. Dry summers do help. That said, this is south of the, oh God, south of Grow Hill. It's not far from Grow Hill. It's um, above the Marchnant, but that big Clywen colliery, uh, colliery, quarry, it's higher up on the ground to the south of that. A very large, large peat bog there. Abergwessen Common would be over the edge there. This was in the hot summer, okay? And this is a dying peat bog, and this is the, the danger. This, it was crunchy. We walked across it. It's, it the water was draining away. Once that happens, uh, the wind gets it and just blows away like dust, okay? Now, the important thing, and we heard this in a, 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 some talk about this only last week, as carbon sinks in the, in the future, in thinking of you know, carbon management, these top everything better than trees. Car peat bogs are priceless. They soak up so much carbon, okay? And we've got this massive landscape which has got large, healthy peat bogs, but some of them are starting to die. Now, climate change is going to kill more and more of them. Changing weather patterns of more rain may help them, but they need management. And in fair play, there, there are things going on in Wales, there are things going on in the Elan, Val Elan estate itself to start managing these, start blocking up the water channels to re-flood these peat bogs before they dry out, before we lose them. Because these are very important part of the future of dealing with climate change and with, 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 with the carbon in the atmosphere. But it's the first time I've seen such big peat bogs literally drying up in front of our eyes this summer, in that hot, those hot months of the summer. It was, it was quite, quite sad, actually, wasn't it? It was like, you, know, you can see them dying in front of you. But like I say, the other tragedy is that all that peat is just vegetation that's built up over thousands of years. And every summer, every winter, new stuff is laid down. So if someone's lit a fire, the soot gets into it. You know, if there's been a volcano somewhere, the soot gets into it. You know, so if there are oak trees growing up there, the pollen will be in there. And we can read the whole history of that landscape back to the Bronze Age. So if we lose those, not only lose the carbon sink, we lose the heritage. So they're, they're a very important part of, of, of these uplands. And that is probably where well, I'm going the wrong way. I think that's my last slide. Yes, thank you. So I just want to finish by saying, I hope in this random sort of talk that I've impressed on you how important those hills are. Okay, the, 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 the importance of getting it right is one thing, but the importance of celebrating it, actually understanding it and loving those hills is massive. And there's, and there's talk about making it AONB and so forth, yes, and, and all these things that go around. You cannot overstate the importance of the Elenic Hills. And it's not just the Elan estate, but it goes beyond that. And it goes to, you know, north, south, east, west. It goes outside the, 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 the boundaries of the estate. So if there's any questions, I'm, we're, we're here to answer them. But thank you for your patience. I hope I haven't kept you too long, but I've done my best. Thank you very much. Thank you.